Two weeks ago during the Biblical Counseling Training Conference, my schedule was full, not just with teaching, but with various meetings, eatings, and greetings. The eatings portion of my day normally did not conclude until about 9.30 in the evening, and one particular night we were having this delightful time with a church from Florida, and I just kept eating and eating and eating, and then it was time for dessert, and I was like, I am done. Like, no more. I can't put another bite in my mouth. But the table was absolutely convinced that not only did I need to have dessert, but I needed to take dessert home to my wife so that we could have it together at 10 p.m. And so I obeyed. Now, mind you, those desserts were good, but after I finished, I thought I was going to literally explode. I could see the headline in the paper, Pastor Explodes After Conference Guests Encourage Him to Eat Too Much. I was completely and utterly fulfilled that evening. But did you know that God wants you to be completely and utterly fulfilled in your relationship with Jesus? Did you know that God wants you to be so satisfied and so confident and so comforted by Christ that you do all things in order to please him? That's one of the reasons why our annual theme this year is In Christ Alone. We want everyone in our church to be absolutely convinced that satisfaction and confidence and comfort and fulfillment is found first and foremost in Christ. And this morning, we're going to be thinking about the concept of fulfilled in Christ alone. And with that in mind, I'd like you to turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 8, and that is on page 157 of the back section of the Bible that's in the chair in front of you. Page 157 of the back section of the Bible in the chair in front of you. Colossians 2, 8. Now, as you're turning there, I would like to emphasize two things that we have already learned so far in our study of Colossians. Number one, Paul is writing to a church that has accomplished many things. The church has a very positive reputation. He did not know them personally, but he knew about them because of their work. He had heard of their faith. He had heard of their love for one another because they understood the glories that were yet to come in heaven and that they have a love in the Holy Spirit for one another. Not a bad reputation. After all, I could think of a whole lot worse. But then Paul prays, as he normally does in his letters, for something that is very important for that particular church to understand. And he prays, addressing one of the needs that they have. And so he writes, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be, fulfilled, be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. See, Paul wanted them to understand God's will with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And requests like this in the Bible are normally focused on the revealed will of God, where he has already told us in his word what it is that he wants from us. He wants from us, for example, to be sexually pure. He wants us to give thanks in all things. He wants us to live for the glory of Christ. Among other, those are the things he says, this is the will of God. So when Paul prays for the Colossians, he's praying that they would be word-centered, obedient Christians by focusing on Christ and all that he has and all that he does and all that he has done specifically for them. They will learn to please him in all respects. Then there were also false teachers, and they were alive and active and enough of the church was following those false teachers that Paul decides to specifically address the church about them. And here in chapter 2, beginning in verse 8, notice what it says. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him... All the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. 
and he is the head over all rule and authority. And in, and in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you are now also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you and your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions as he has seen, inflated without cause by his own fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with a growth which is from God. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of this world, why, as if you are living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men? These are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but they are of no value against fleshly indulgence. And I would like us to consider, with the time that I have, three ways that we can be fulfilled in Christ alone. That we can be filled to the max, that we can get to the place where we are so excited and so encouraged in Christ that, well, we just might explode. And here's the first one. Three ways that I can be fulfilled. Number one, beware that you do not accept false teaching of any kind. Beware that you do not accept false teaching of any kind. That's how the passage began. See to it that no one takes you captive See to it that no one takes you captive. We've spoken several times about this false teaching or this Colossian heresy that was present in the church, but nowhere in Scripture does it tell us what it is. Maybe one of the reasons for that is that false teaching would be present until the day Jesus returns. And so you and I were told, as much as we were told for the purpose of reminding ourselves of the importance of of being on guard against any form of false teaching, regardless of where it comes from. We could say from the Colossian prayer in verses 9 through 14, that in some form or fashion, this was moving them away from being obedient to the will of God, and it was moving them away from being obedient to Christ. And so from the description, we can actually surmise a little bit about this false teaching and really what any kind of false teaching, the characteristics that it possesses. And we have to be on guard lest it take us captive, lest we be kidnapped by false teaching. That kind of imagery encourages us to be aware, be on our guard. So how do we recognize it? First of all, the origin of false teaching will be human tradition rather than God and Christ. The origin of false teaching will be human tradition rather than God and Christ. The language of the text says this, according to the traditions of men. Sometimes false teaching comes in the form of research. Sometimes it comes in the form of opinions. Sometimes it comes in the form of false history. And the argument at first seems really compelling. It seems to make some logical sense, except one thing that you begin to notice is that nobody actually has an open Bible. Nobody's paying attention to what God's Word actually has to say. So you begin to, to think, wait a second. Is that really what the truth of the Word of God says? Is that really true or is this false teaching that is coming in in a very subtle fashion that is trying to take over and captivate my heart and my life? The content 
will also not be consistent with the sovereignty, supremacy, and sufficiency of Christ. The language, again, is that this is going to come from, quote-unquote, philosophy and empty deception. That's the words that we find in verse 8, philosophy and empty deception, and they were umbrella terms for systems of thought and the implications of that thought. If you tuned in to the Biblical Counseling Training Conference on Thursday night, you heard Phil and Robin Byers, the ones who had their daughter murdered in Indianapolis, tell their story. And as Phil was describing it, at, right after the events of his daughter's murder, there were individuals who were giving him all sorts of advice and counsel. And one of the things that he said is, I heard people say, just curse God over what happened to your daughter. And with intensity in Phil's voice, he says, I don't know what to do. I didn't know how to feel. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to do with my life. But I knew this, that I was not going to curse God. See what he was doing? He was running this particular set of advice through a grid of Scripture. And he was saying, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I know what I'm not supposed to do. You tell me I should cling to God? Okay, fine. You tell me I should run in God's direction? Okay, fine. You tell me that I should confess my hurts to God and ask Him for His help? Okay, fine. But if you tell me to curse God, there's no way I'm doing that. It's false teaching. And I'm not going to be part of that. Because I can run that garbage through the grid of Scripture and I see that it comes out faulty and void and empty that's not what's going to fill me up it's going to take me down it's going to captivate my heart and control me and i'm not going there see false teaching gives itself away sometimes it gives itself away through the origin sometimes it gives its way it gives itself away through its content and sometimes it gives its way it gives itself away through motivation The motivation will serve self rather than Christ. The language of verse 8 was according to the elementary principles rather than according to Christ. Some translations differ on the English words that we should even put into the text. But here is what is clear about that particular section. Is that there are times when there are arguments that are made to set and control our hearts and life, like you will be happy if, and then you fill in the blank. You have a right to blank, and then you fill fill it in. You have a, a right, or you would be blessed by something, or you will earn favor from God if you do something. Biblical motivation is always about Christ. And if he decides to grant us favor and blessing, then that is his decision. That is his call. But our motivation is to be based on Christ. And if it's not, if something is competing for our heart, our mind, our thoughts, and it doesn't find its origin in the word, and its content isn't consistent with biblical truth, and its motivation isn't all about Christ, then it has to be dismissed. I think it's pretty awesome to have Christ, don't you? And that's why Paul would continue to see then and say, be confident in Christ and his work in you, in his work in you. I wish I had a whole sermon for this particular section because it's loaded with awesome truth. The reason that you can be confident is, first of all, because Christ is fully God. In verse 9, it says, For in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. If you've been attending Adult Bible Fellowship, we've been working our way through the Gospel of Mark, and in the first eight chapters, He dedicates Himself to one question, and that is, Who is Jesus? And one of the answers that He gives is that Jesus is God. It's seen in Mark at the very beginning with the quotation of Isaiah and Malachi coming together. It comes in his offer of forgiveness of sin, and everybody starts saying, well, who has the right to forgive but God alone? Exactly. 
and the calming of the storm. Who has the power to do this except God alone? Or the feeding of the 5,000, walking on the water, both of them were illustrations that only God can do this. In Philippians 2, one of the most amazing texts of Scripture, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We can happily sing, all I have is Christ, because in him I have a lot In fact, verse 10, put it this way, you were made complete, you were filled up, you were fulfilled in Christ. You were like me on that one evening of the BCTC where I just kept eating and eating and eating and then people were giving me more things to eat and by the time I was done, I was fulfilled, completely fulfilled. And that is exactly what Paul says about here, about Christ right here. Why is it that you would need to listen to false teaching? That focuses on statements outside the Bible. That have content that's not consistent with the Bible. And do not lift up the name of Christ. You're already full in Christ. Paul uses that that idea to describe believers. And that's why when we write and read and sing songs like, All I have is Christ, people shouldn't feel sorry for me. They should be jealous They shouldn't feel sorry for me. They should be jealous. Look at what Christ offers. There are five things that he describes in the next five verses from verse 11 to 15 that they describe the ways in which I was complete in Christ. First one is by making us part of the people of God. By making us part of the people of God. Colossians 2.11 says this, And in him you were also circumcised, with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. In the Old Testament, physical circumcision was a big deal. In fact, it, is, it was such a big deal that it even carries on into traditions today. But even Moses recognized this, that circumcision of the flesh did not necessarily mean that the people were going to adopt the concerns that the Lord had. And so even Moses discussed a circumcision of the heart where he recognized that outward behavior is not necessarily going to occur because of the workings of the inward human heart. And while somebody might be conformed to a set of standards, They really weren't going to be transformed in the inner man because only God could do that. Only God could bring about the circumcision of the heart. And Paul now picks up that same kind of imagery right here and he reminds us that this is who we are. Physical circumcision was a physical sign that said you are part of the covenant community of God. It was a big deal. And now Paul uses this idea of the circumcision of the heart and says that when Christ did that for you, he made you part of the people of God. First Peter also picks up this idea, says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, for you were once not a people. But now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter picks up on that same idea. What better status symbol could we ask for than we are now the people of God? And as a result of being the people of God, it ought to encourage us. It ought to say in our hearts, man, praise God for that. I am complete. I am fulfilled in Christ. Then he goes on by making us spiritually alive. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the workings of God who raised him from the dead. But when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of of your flesh, he made you alive together with him. We all know that we were once dead in our trespasses and sins. And yet God, through the work of his Holy Spirit, made us alive together with Christ 
I understand that I am in some ways rebellious and hard-hearted before the Lord. I'm sure that you could confess the very same thing. But I know this, I respond to the Lord's word differently than other people do. There is a sensitivity. There is an alive and awake condition that not all people share. The word does find its way eventually into my mind. The word does eventually bear fruit. But for others, it goes in one ear and out the other. And friends, can I just encourage you that if you're struggling with that experience... Maybe your heart has never been made new. Maybe you have never experienced the circumcision of the heart. Maybe you have never been made alive together with Christ. Maybe you remain in your spiritually dead condition. Can I please urge you to understand the significance of sin? Can I encourage you to understand that the wages of sin is death Can I encourage you that the answer to the wages of sin is death, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Can I urge you to put your faith and your trust in Him alone and His finished work? One writer long ago said it this way, that unbelievers are walking on rotten boards over the pit of hell. And it's just going to be the next, it might be the next step. It might be the next step. It might be the next step. And if you don't know Christ, if this experience, you're not filled up in Christ, you're not fulfilled in Christ, you don't find your joy, your satisfaction, your comfort coming from Christ, maybe it's because you have never been made alive together with Christ. And if that's the case, I want to encourage you to repent of your sin and trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus right now. And if not, you want to talk to somebody, then please see us after the service at the visitor tent and somebody will talk to you and pray with you about how you can know for sure that you are on your way to heaven and that you are, in fact, made alive together with Christ. Well, if that's not good enough, he also reminds us that he forgave us our sin. How is it that we were filled up? How is it that we are complete in Christ? It's having been forgiven of all of our transgressions. You know, while we're just talking about the gospel, you know, Pastor Trey's video last week regarding children's ministry highlighted that a number of people trust Christ at an early age. And we want to witness to every single adult in our community. We want everybody to know the message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But one of the things we also want to do is to evangelize the children, too. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't thought very much about Serve 17 yet... Now would be a good time to evaluate that. You can go to service at 8. You can go to children's ministry at 9.30. And then you can do your ABF or whatever at 11. And you say, well, three services. Uh, Let me tell you just a little story. Years ago, you remember when we had the 1015 service over in the community center? It was a number of years ago. And when Pastor Byers first announced that, one of my kids um, he knew that we, we were going to all the services anyway, so we were at 8 and 9.30 and 11, and, and he really did, acted like he wasn't paying attention to Pastor Byers as he was preaching, and then when Pastor Byers mentioned that we were going to start a 10.15 service, he woke up, and he looks over at me, and he says, Dad, are we going to that service too? <laughs> kind of like, whoa, are you serious? Like, we're going four services, are we going to all those too? Let me tell you something. Once you get used to it, it's not a big deal. Once you get used to it, it's not a big deal. And it may be that God wants you to serve in that particular way. Then by canceling our debts, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. I hate being in debt, don't you? It's annoying. In fact, the Bible puts it this way, as it's hostile against you. It's annoying, isn't it? I mean, every time that you want to spend something, you have to ask proverbially the people that you owe whether or not you can do that or not. I'm tired of writing my mortgage checks, aren't you? I mean, every month you have to write one of those things, and then you you essentially have to ask them permission to buy something, to invest in something, to give in something. Well, you know what? Our sin put us in debt, 
Our sin put us in debt to a holy God. And here's what he says. Here's one of the ways you've been fulfilled, filled up in Christ, as he took that debt and he nailed it to the cross. Praise God for that, huh? And if we can't get excited about that, I don't know what we would get excited about. And then he describes it, verse 15, by giving us victory over our enemies. By giving us victory over our enemies. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. In other words, when Jesus was raised from the dead, he demonstrated victory. You remember the old song by Carmen, where where it it talks about Satan, and, and Satan knows he's like in serious trouble because Jesus rose from the dead? That's the picture. And you know what? This table represents so much, doesn't it? We really have a perfect passage to celebrate. We're the people of God. We've been made spiritually alive. We've had our sins forgiven. We've had our debts erased. We've been given victory. Praise God for that. In case you're wondering, man, you seem like really wound up. I've got like no sleep. I came in on a late night flight and from Minneapolis, and so if you're wondering, man, this guy's like juiced up. I'm probably just running on adrenaline. Catch me at 3 o'clock this afternoon. I'll be conked out wherever I am. But not right now. Not right now. Because I'm fired up. I'm fired up about what Christ has done for us and how he has fulfilled us and made us complete And we get to celebrate this table, which is a picture of it. How can we be fulfilled in Christ? Just as my meal was overflowing, beware of all kinds of false teaching. Knowing that sometimes its origin isn't from the Word. Sometimes its content isn't consistent with the Word. Sometimes its motivation isn't Christ-centered. Be confident in Christ because of all that we have in Him. And then, number three, is to embrace the freedom that you have in Christ Jesus. Embrace the freedom. If your sin is paid and your debt is erased and your enemies have been vanquished, then you would think that you would not have any more problems. But the reality is is that we sort of create some of our own, don't we? We become the false teachers, if you will. Not in the sense of teaching another gospel, but in the sense of assigning commands to God that he didn't assign to himself. So the Lord was so gracious to give us this next section because we have freedom from legalism. Freedom from legalism. Notice how the text described it. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come. But the substance, the substance belongs to Christ. And then he writes a little bit later, For if we died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, which we have, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees, such as, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use, in accordance with the commandments and the teachings of men. We all have reasons to like or dislike something. I mean, some people are convinced that, you know, forks over knives or Atkins or some sort of supplement is the best approach to eating. There are others who are very passionate about certain days of the week or days of the year. There are others who are wound tight about certain types of beverages. But you know, when we focus there, what are we focusing on? The shadow. We're focusing on the shadow. We're putting our energy into the shadow and not putting it into the substance, which is Christ. All of those things are consumed. They are destroyed with use and exchanged into something else, but not Christ. So let's devote ourselves to Christ. And if someone disagrees with how we're going to do Christmas or Halloween or the 4th of July, or we give somebody an Easter basket, just relax. Relax. It'll be okay. And if they can do that to the glory and honor of God, then, well, praise God for that, right? But we're not going to wrestle with that kind of stuff. Christ is a substance, so they have freedom. If they want to eat kale every single meal of their entire life, let them have kale every single meal of their entire life. 
Then we also have freedom from self-righteousness. I exercised control there, didn't I? (laughs) We have freedom from self-righteousness. He says this, Let no one keep defrauding you of the prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels. Don't let anybody defraud you out of the prize, swindle you out of it, if you will. These are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but they are of no value against fleshly indulgence. See, maybe a greater danger is one that we decide that we need to live according to the concept of penance, that we feel righteous as long as we do these certain things, and no, we're not going to, to do it the old way, but we're going to create our own way. And as long as I put myself through a certain amount of torment, then I feel better about myself that, okay, now I'm back to good again. There is no form of self-righteousness that's going to work. Understand that God created this world in order to oppose self-righteousness. And so if you try to conjure up any sort of self-righteousness, it is going to end up in desperation and discouragement for you because God designed the world not to be about self-righteousness. And so you are constantly going to be against the way God designed his world to be. Let's instead enjoy the freedom from that bondage. And then we also have freedom from mysticism. Freedom from mysticism. Notice how it's Colossians 2, 18 and 19. Taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head to whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with a growth which is from God. Some people are really excited about what seems spiritual. They want to find hidden messages and all sorts of things. Wow, you had a dream. Ooh. You had a vision. Ah. But these things, Paul describes, are inflated without cause in our own fleshly minds. We think they're more important than what they really are. Scripture encourages us to think carefully. And some thoughts do not deserve much time and attention in our minds. I really like the song called Man of Sorrows. Here's the chorus. Hallelujah. God be praised. He's risen from that grave. Oh, the rugged cross, my salvation, where your blood poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah. Hallelujah means praise the Lord. Praise and honor unto thee. There's an awesome text today, huh? Wonderful passage, reminding us to beware, reminding us that we are filled up in Christ, and reminding us that as a result of being filled up with Christ, we are set free from all the bondage that we impose upon ourselves. Not only were we set free from the bondage that was opposed on us, but we're also set free from the bondage that we create. So let's pray and ask the Lord to please help us, and then we're going to sing one more song. And then we'll have our our closing announcements. Father, we want to thank you for this wonderful text that reminds us that we are completely filled up in Christ. So much more than just a meal. Lord, you remind us that Jesus is in whom the fullness of deity dwells. That it's in Jesus that we are made complete because he made us part of the people of God through a circumcision not made with hands, but one that was done on the heart. He also chose to forgive us of our sins and made us alive together with Christ, even though we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And then he canceled out all of our debts, which were hostile to us. And then, Lord, we want to thank you for the wonderful privilege that we have now of living that out and setting us free from all of the bondages, not only from the outside, but the ones that we create ourselves. So Lord, would you please help us to be filled up in Christ 
and to live as if all I have is Christ is far more than what I actually need. In Jesus' name, amen.